Hello, my name is Anna and I love trying vintage recipes. So today I'm trying three meatless main dishes from the 1970s. Today's recipes come to us from Good Housekeeping's One Dish Dinners. This book was published in 1972 and I'll talk more about it a little bit later. There are a lot of reasons why people might wanna add a couple of meatless meals to their weekly meal plan. Maybe they're just trying to eat less meat overall. Sometimes, you know, it can help save a little bit of money. You know, meat can be expensive. And there are a lot of creative ideas out there. These are just three recipes I chose from this cookbook because I thought they were just kind of like interesting. And maybe, you know, maybe if you don't choose these exactly, it might help spark some ideas for you. It's also Lent right now. So I thought this would kind of be like the perfect and appropriate time to share a few new ideas. I'm gathering up all of my ingredients, but before I get into my first recipe, I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Babbel. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you may remember when I picked up this French cookbook in hopes of trying some of the recipes. So far, that has not happened. <laughs> I took three years of French in high school, and I've always wished that I'd continue to grow my language skills. So that's why I was really excited to learn about Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. It teaches real life conversation through lessons designed by actual language teachers. Babbel is scientifically proven to help you learn a new language in just three weeks. Des olives. Des olives. Des cacahuètes. Des cacahuètes. That's peanuts. <laughs> no matter where you're starting from, Babbel can help you recommit and refocus on reaching your language learning goals. They have multiple plans to choose from, including a lifetime subscription. Click on my link in the description down below to get 60% off your subscription. I mean, at least now I can read some of these recipe titles, right? <laughs> That is tarte aux fruits d'hiver. So it's like a, a winter fruit tart. Le gratin de chou. So that's like a, a cabbage gratin. That's that, doesn't that look delicious? Gratin aux champignons. It's like a mushroom, mushroom gratin. Anyway, I'm getting there. Thank you again to Babbel for sponsoring this portion of the video. I'm starting off with this asparagus cheese pie. When I saw this recipe, I thought automatically my mind was like, okay, this is gonna be a quiche. Nope, this recipe starts with a pie crust mix. I originally thought maybe I could sub in pre-made pie crust or whatever. Um, you actually, you probably could do that if you skipped one step in this recipe. I'm adding cheese to the pie crust mix per the recipe. So if you didn't care about that part, you could probably skip the pie crust mix and go with a pre-made pie crust. There would just be a little bit less cheese in your asparagus cheese pie. I have used this pie crust mix for a couple of things. I've actually never, I don't think I've ever used it for a, a pie though. You know, I've used it in other recipes. I have to flip between following this recipe and following the instructions on the back of the box. Add half a cup of the cheddar cheese to the pie crust mix. So I have half a cup of finely shredded sharp cheddar cheese. Stir pie crust mix and cold water until pastry forms a ball. I'm using a Betty Crocker pie crust mix. Uh, I think Jiffy makes one. Whatever you're using, just follow the package instructions. So I have to add the pouch of the mix and then this is two tablespoons plus two teaspoons of cold water. And you know what, if you're ambitious, you could probably make your own pie crust. If you're good at it, if you have a recipe you like, just make it and add a little cheese to it. <laughs> I may need to add just a little, little bit more water, we'll see. And it's looking like it could benefit. It maybe just needs a little bit more hydration, not very much. So I'm gonna mix that in. I switched over to a fork. You're seeing some pea-sized crumbles in here. I washed my hands, I just wanna see Still a little dry, I think. I'm gonna add a couple more drops of water. I feel like this might be a little hard to roll. Flatten ball into round. Mm. Still crumbly is all get out. So I used this pie crust mix. Uh, I used one for my peach double deckers, which was our Betty Crocker recipes from Betty Crocker's cookbook for boys and girls. That was kind of perfect because you made like smaller smaller balls um, after you mix up the pie crust and then you flatten them into sort of like small rounds. And that that was super simple. I just feel like maybe <laughs> trying to roll this into a big pie crust is gonna give me, give me some issues. And I, you know, I don't like to be pessimistic, but <laughs> I wonder if I could just like press this. I kind of think that might not be a bad idea in this case. It's just feeling bad. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna give it a try. I just 
feel like my result might work a little better. And I know, I know, we're not supposed to work pie crust too much with our hands. Like I know the heat of your hands not great for this, but also I need to get a I need to get a crust in here. It needs to happen. <laughs> and you know, this isn't going to be like a fruit pie for dessert or anything like that. It's nothing super fancy. So I think I'm, you know, it may upset you. <laughs> but it's gonna be fine for what I'm doing, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with this. <laughs> so I have to prick this just a little bit with a fork and I'm gonna go ahead and bake this according to package directions. There are other instructions in the recipe, but I am opting to follow the package directions on this just because like the pie crust mix they used back in 1972 is possibly different than the one I'm using. So I have to bake this for about eight minutes at 450 degrees. The crust just came out of the oven, so I need to let that cool for a few minutes, and now I'm going to prep my asparagus. So this is just 20 ounces of frozen asparagus that I cooked according to package directions. I need to choose 12 stalks because we're making a garnish. You know, I love a garnish. Let's, who's nice looking? How many is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I need five more. Did I do it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, I need one more. You, I choose you. You're supposed to cut these like ends off and that's gonna be your garnish for the pie. And you're supposed to include approximately three inches of the stock. So I'm gonna set these, these aside. And then the rest I just need to chop up. My crust is cooling, the asparagus is all prepped. So now I have to make a Swiss cheese sauce. So I have a couple of tablespoons of butter in a saucepan that I have melted. And I need to add a quarter of a cup of flour. Coming in with a twist whisk. I like that you can flatten this out too because it kind of gets in the corners really, really nicely. Like a roux whisk. So now I have a cup and a half of milk that I'm adding and whisking. So now I just need to continue to whisk this until it boils. This is definitely thickened. It's kind of starting to bubble on the sides. And I was just looking at the recipe and I realized there's like not really any other seasoning in the asparagus. So this better be a really flavorful sauce. So now I have to stir in four ounces of shredded Swiss cheese. My hand's in the way, sorry. Quarter teaspoon of salt, eighth of a teaspoon of pepper, and then just a pinch of nutmeg and a pinch of paprika. So I'm gonna go ahead and just whisk that in until it is incorporated. All assembled, <laughs> it's just like, everything. It's all going to come together here in one moment. So this is my chopped asparagus and it needs to go into my cooled, slightly cooled pie shelf. In you go. Kind of looks like green beans. <laughs> green bean pie doesn't have the same, like the same sound to it. <laughs> I'd try it though. Make sure it's evenly distributed. That is a lot of asparagus. <laughs> so now I need to pour my sauce, my cheese sauce over the top. And I'm wondering, it's it's quite a thick sauce. It's still warm. I just got it off of the stove. Is it supposed to like seep down in? I don't know. You go over here. So let me just smooth you out. I can't say I've had anything like this before. I thought for sure it was like, oh, this is a quiche, right? But it is not. There's no egg in this. I have one fourth of a cup of finely shredded sharp cheddar cheese. That's pretty hard to say. It kind of looks like I'm making a weird custard pie, but okay. <laughs> Wait, where did this, I was supposed to put something somewhere, hold on. Oh, okay. So these guys are come. they're gonna be after I actually broil the pie. Okay. So I have to broil this, take it out, put these on and then broil it again. <laughs> okay, so broil number one. It's just supposed to happen until the cheese melts and it looks pretty melted to me. Let's put a little paprika. We're, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it now. I don't think it is gonna hurt too much for me to do it at this stage because I feel like this is just to give it a little, little pizzazz in the looks department. I need to take my little spears that I've set aside and I need to make some sort of design. <laughs> we'll figure it out, won't we? I don't know. Do I really need 12? I, I don't know about this 12 thing. It might look pretty good just like that to me anyway. <laughs> it's fine. I think it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'll eat these asparagus spears somehow. This next broil is actually timed. I'm supposed to broil this for another two minutes. 
And there is the finished pie. Oh, I think it looks so pretty, but I can't cut into it until I let it cool for about 10 minutes. Not holding its shape too well, which I suspected would kind of be a thing because it's not like a quiche where an egg like sort of bakes and takes a shape. I did let it cool for probably 15 minutes instead of 10, because I thought maybe that would solidify it a little bit more. But you know what, I think it's gonna be pretty tasty. I mean, I'm just, just thinking about it. Let's, let's take a little taste here. Mmm, that's really good and like different. A lot of asparagus. So here's something I would have probably thought about doing and maybe it would have yielded a little bit like tighter results. It's not too bad actually. So you can see where I cut a wedge and it's, it's kind of holding. Um, so my thought here is, you know, make your cheese sauce, reserve a little bit of it for the top, but take your asparagus and maybe like mix it with the cheese sauce. Mix the chopped asparagus with, with some of the cheese sauce, put it in the pie shell, and then spread the remainder on top. So you still get this kind of like very smooth look, but I feel like it maybe would have helped if some of the cheese sauce would have like seeped through the asparagus. There was so much asparagus in there. And this is even like a bigger pie dish than what they recommend. They say a nine inch pie dish in the recipe, this is nine and a half. But honestly, taste wise, this is very good. If you like asparagus, if you don't like asparagus, this isn't for you. A lot of nice flavor from the sauce. You know how Swiss cheese has, depending on what kind you use, it has kind of a mild flavor, but it's very distinctive and like specific. I probably would have added cayenne. <laughs> I just like things a little more zesty than this, but it does have, it does taste really good. For my next meatless main dish, I'm going to be making this baked eggs and spinach casserole. I have really been loving baked eggs lately, so I wanted to give this one a try. I am cutting this recipe in half, so I'm using a smaller dish in a shallow baking dish, toss spinach with salt and spread in an even layer. This is frozen spinach that I have thawed and drained very well as per the recipe. And it just says salt, so I'm gonna just do, it's like, you know, a two taste kind of thing. So I am just gonna sprinkle some salt in there, mix it up. And then it just says to spread it out. I do have to make indentations. Yeah, it says with spoon, make six indentations in spinach. I'm making three. So that's that's kind of where we're at in the recipe. I have to move over to the stove to make a cheese sauce. This cheese sauce is going to be very similar to the cheese sauce I made for my previous dish, except we're gonna use a different kind of cheese. So that is butter. So I'll just give that a little time here. All right, the butter is good and melted. So now I gotta add some flour. Coming in with my twist whisk and just whisking that until it is smooth. Again, I love to flatten this out and just kind of make sure that any flour I have around the edges gets incorporated. And yes, I would be doing this in a slightly larger saucepan if I were making the full recipe. <laughs> I know this is a small one. Okay, so now I'm adding my milk. We're gonna whisk until that thickens up. So we've thickened up here. And now I'm adding two ounces of shredded cheddar cheese. This is two ounces that I've shredded very finely. So if you think it's more than two ounces, you are wrong because I weighed it. <laughs> it is per the recipe. Sometimes I think when I shred the cheese really fine, people think I'm adding more than what's called for, but I promise you. So I am going to mix this in until it is just melted. Back with my sauce. Looking good. This is a pretty quick one actually to assemble anyway. It says break one egg into each indentation. Since I'm cutting the recipe in half, I have three eggs. I'm gonna break them into this little cup one at a time. And then I'm gonna put them in here carefully because we don't wanna break the yolks. One down. <laughs> kind of making me think of that gold rush brunch casserole I made ages ago because it's kind of it's not a bed of spinach, it's a bed of potatoes that you bake the eggs in, but it's it's got a similar feel to it. Alrighty. Oh gosh, I'm gonna tip it a little bit, but look how cute. Okay, sprinkle eggs with pepper and salt. So I ended up just getting my pepper grinder out. So we got a little pepper. And again, I'm just gonna go a little pinch of salt over the whole thing. Pour sauce over eggs, bake half an hour until eggs are desired doneness. You know, we're probably not gonna be able to see my cute little eggs because they're gonna get covered in sauce, but look how they do look very cute right now. So I wanted to make sure you saw before I put this sauce on and bake it. 
This is kind of reminding me of the recipe I made for that asparagus pie because it's like top everything with a cheese sauce. <laughs> but you know what? It's very useful to know how to make a white sauce and make that white sauce into a cheese sauce. You can do a lot of things with it. Okay, I'm trying to be careful because again, I don't really want to break the yolks, but I do want to evenly, try to evenly like get this out here. Okay, you know what? That's as good. That's, that's what we're doing. So it says to bake this at 325 for half an hour or until the eggs are set. Can we, whoa, focus. So I'm supposed to serve this with toast. So I just made a piece of toast and cut it into little wedges. It smells like spinach. It smells like spinach, but I like spinach. So that's all right, isn't it? I'm gonna just kind of like cut a little off and put it on the toast. I mean, it doesn't give a lot of instruction. <laughs> Mmm, that is good. I think the toast is a must here. I really do. I don't, because originally I was like, maybe you can just eat this on its own. I think you have to put it on the toast because it just makes a really delightful kind of bite, I guess. I don't know, the cheese really complements the spinach and the eggs. Like it all works together on top of the toast to just make something really tasty. I guess this is kind of like eggs quarantine, but I don't think I've actually made that on my channel. It's delicious wasn't too hard to put together really, as long as you know how to make a cheese sauce. I mean, it explains how to do it if you don't. So I think I baked mine for like 25 minutes and it's the, the yolks are pretty set, like they're a little jammy. So if you wanted them runny, I'd say go down to about 20 minutes or something and just kind of check on it. I think I'm gonna eat the rest of it for breakfast for a couple of days. I think that would be really good. I'm always trying to figure out good ways to like put vegetables in my breakfasts that seem logical. I guess you could say, I mean, you can eat whatever you want for breakfast. I think this this would be like a really good brunch dish as well. I didn't know what to expect from this one, but I really enjoy it. <laughs> for my last meatless main dish, I'm making this avocado and spinach salad. And I really think if you do it right, a main dish kind of salad with lots of yummy ingredients can be a very satisfying meal. If I followed the full recipe, it was gonna make four main dish servings. I wouldn't say that I'm following everything exactly to a T, especially like for the greens part of it. I didn't like weigh anything out, but that's kind of the beauty of a salad is that you can customize them and make it so that it's for one person and get sort of a similar flavor profile. So the first ingredient is an envelope of garlic cheese salad dressing mix. Now, I don't think they make the exact one that they're requesting in the recipe anymore. The closest I could find was this and it doesn't have cheese in it. So what I did is I mixed this this morning according to package instructions, and then I added about a tablespoon, actually it's probably less than a tablespoon of grated Parmesan cheese to sort of stand in for that, for that cheese that was originally in the mix. In a large salad bowl, toss spinach with the rest of the ingredients. So I have some bite-sized pieces of lettuce and I'm gonna mix my spinach in with that. Probably should have gotten a bigger bowl. The thing is, this is a very cute bowl but you can't see the design because it's covered. So we're gonna just let it peek out here. Can you see? See how cute that is? Now you know that my intentions were good. <laughs> I am gonna start by dressing the greens a little bit. Actually, let me, let me shake this up again. Hello. I know people love good seasons Italian dressing. I, I know I've had it. It's just, it wasn't like something that was a frequent, you know, thing that we had. But have you tried this one, the garlic and herb? Let me know what you think of it. Cause I do like making my own salad dressing. I don't usually even use a mix. I just kind of do herbs and oil, vinegar, whatever. Oh, it's gonna be so good. This is such a good start already, I think. Also, I didn't realize what a spinach heavy menu I made <laughs> for today's video. Now we have a bunch of other delicious ingredients. This is thinly sliced red onion debated because I'm not like, again, a super huge fan of crunchy red onion. I'm gonna put this on for now and I'll taste it and maybe I'll love it. I love a pickled red onion, so. And this is some grated Swiss cheese. I don't know that I'm gonna use all of this. This has got a lot of things in it. Now we have some hard cooked egg. This is one egg that I have quartered. I'm gonna try to arrange it nicely. <laughs> We'll see, we'll see if I can. I feel like I should have put the croutons on next. We're gonna sprinkle a couple of croutons in there, kind of around the edge, I guess. And then I have avocado. Woo. And it just said, I, I probably, me personally, I would dice this, but it said to cut it like into slices. It was not what I would normally do, but it is looking pretty cute, I must admit. Okay, so let me just run through. Yes, I have it all. 
So here we are with our finished salad. Does that not look so delicious? So I think this is a really nice looking salad. It's got a lot of things in it that I like. One ingredient that I'm not sure of, but you know, we'll try it anyway. Maybe I'll be fine with it. Gotta make sure I get a little bit of everything, don't I? I think I got most of it. Mmm. That's pretty dang good. That's pretty dang good. It kind of reminds me of that Taos salad toss that I made for my 70s video. Really good. Just a good combination of flavors. And you may be thinking like, is this really a recipe? Why did you include this? So I included it mostly because I feel like we get into a rut with this kind of thing. We put the same dressings, the same toppings and everything on, on our salads. Sometimes every once in a while, I like to do one of these just to kind of spark people's imaginations, maybe give them some ideas on different things to try, different combinations of ingredients that you can put together in a salad. There's this one salad from Walnut Creek Cheese that I absolutely love uh, called, I think it's called the Colorific Salad. I'll link it in the description down below if I can find it. It's become one of my favorite salads and it just has, it's the combination of ingredients that, that are in the salad, things that you wouldn't even think of necessarily. And then it's got like a really good sort of honey mustard dressing with it. And that's like, that's one of the things that I like about this type of dish is that sometimes you can put things together that you don't always think about. So yeah, stuff like this, I mostly, you know, maybe you don't follow the recipe for this word for word, ingredient for ingredient, but you know, I just kind of want to give you a little inspiration on something different that you can do. Okay, we're talking about one dish dinners from Good Housekeeping. <laughs> Good Housekeeping's One Dish Dinners was published in 1972. I took the dust cover off this book because it was just not in good shape. Also, I'm sorry for the glare. I chose to focus on meatless main dishes, but this book really does contain a lot more than that. So Good Housekeeping books in general, I wouldn't say that I have like a ton of them in my collection, but I have a few. And when I think about Good Housekeeping cookbooks, my mind always goes to a couple of different series that they had. And I even, I grabbed a few of the booklets uh, just to show you some examples. You might be familiar with some of these and I've even covered a couple of these <laughs> on this channel. So there's like this little series of books. They're like little booklets. Um, this one is the meat cookbook. This one is vegetables. I think I may have done a recipe from this one on the channel, delectable desserts. And then I love this one. This is kind of a new addition for me. The egg and cheese and spaghetti and rice <laughs> dishes cookbook. I don't have the complete set of these. I'm kind of working on it, but these little booklets were published in like the mid to late fifties. And then this other series that I have, again, I don't, this is, this is all that I have of them. There's, there's several more. This series was published in the 1960s, like the mid to late sixties. These books, oh my goodness. If you love groovy illustrations, these have some of the best if you ask me. And that seems to be, here, I'll just show you another one real quick. That seems to be kind of sticking with what I would consider cookbook trends in the 50s and the 60s. 70s, still a little bit groovy, but like this one is 72. As we kind of near the 80s, that's when things really start to get serious. And I've said that on this channel before. This particular book, it almost reminds me of a textbook, like the size of it, the feel of it. There's just something about it. I think this is a great little illustration. I cannot tell you how much I love the font that they chose. The focus of this book is one dish meals. And when I hear one dish meal, I automatically think casserole, but this is actually a lot more than that. And I tried to sort of illustrate that a little bit in my video. There's an entire chapter that's just on main dish salads. One dish dinner can also include a soup or a stew. <laughs> I love that the soup chapter is titled, I don't know if you can see it, it says self-sufficient soups. So let's look at the self-sufficient soups. <laughs> Whether simmered for hours or assembled in minutes, these are hearty enough to be the mainstay of any meal. So yeah, I think that kind of explains it well. It's the mainstay of the meal. We have some photographs in here, which is great. This is fun. I love this like pasta. Sorry, I'm trying to get no glare. Pasta situation. And oh, here's one of our self-sufficient soups. Yeah, they just have little sort of sections throughout the book where there's like a few pages with photographs and then it kicks back into sort of like different recipes and stuff. I thought they did a really great job in this book of like creatively dividing the chapters. So I already talked about self-sufficient soups. We've got company feasts, probably something a little, a little nicer, a little fancier. Family dinners, good for every day. Busy day specials. I am interested in that one. I, I, I kind of want to check that one out in the future. New life for leftovers. I love 
using leftovers. Like I love coming up with ways to use them. Often it's like leftover meat. Think about reasons you might have leftovers. Often it's a holiday and we do have a holiday coming up. You know, Easter is later this month and maybe you'll have some leftover ham or some leftover lamb. You gotta think of ways to use that stuff up. I like that there's an entire chapter on repurposing these leftovers into something new. It really kind of depends on what kind of leftovers you have. Right away, like I opened to the very first page of this particular chapter and there's three ham recipes. So if you are a ham family for Easter, this book has got quite a few, quite a few ways to use it up. I tried to focus on meatless main dishes. I kind of stated my reasons at the beginning of the video. Some people are just trying to eat less meat overall. You know, it could be for health reasons or it could be for money saving purposes. Although I do understand lately eggs have kind of like jumped up in price a little bit. And I do have two dishes that contain eggs in, in my video. But even though the price has gone up on eggs, there's still an excellent and inexpensive source of protein. And you know, another reason of course that I focused on meatless main dishes is because it is the season of Lent. I did an entire Lenten menu last year with like fish, side dishes and everything. I grew up observing Lent. Uh, for us, every Friday was fish fry Friday. <laughs> but you know, at lunchtime we did, we did avoid meat as well. So we would eat a lot of vegetable soup and grilled cheese and that kind of thing. But I wanted to try to come up with some other ideas that, you know, if you're not gonna go out for fish fry Friday, <laughs> Maybe, maybe you're cooking at home. Some other things that might work for you. And these would work throughout the year. They're not just for Lent. I am 100% making these again, really. So let's, I mean, now that I'm doing it, let's, let's just talk about the dishes that I made today. So the first dish was asparagus and cheese pie. So delicious. I really enjoyed that. I do have a few critiques and things that I would probably change though. First off, Honestly, I did not think that the cheese and the crust was necessary. And just in the interest of saving time and making it easier, I probably would have used like a prepared refrigerated pie crust. If I absolutely wanted the cheese, I probably would have made my own pie crust. That pie crust mix, not the easiest to work with. I'm not the only person to say that. I have, I have watched other creators use that pie crust mix in vintage recipes and it's really not that easy to roll out. So I've made my own pie crust and it turned out beautifully and really delicious. And it was much easier to work with texture wise than that mix. I would say either use a pre-made pie crust and skip the cheese, or if you're like, I have to have this cheese, make your own. Don't use that mix. <laughs> Sorry, Betty. Sorry, Betty Crocker. The other thing I would do, it didn't completely, completely fall apart while I was eating it the first time. You know, I did reheat leftovers. I gave some leftovers away and I did reheat some of them for, for you know, future lunches. And it tasted amazing. Like it still maintained that delicious flavor. But when I reheated it, I just used the microwave. It kind of went and like melted <laughs> all over. To help it maintain its shape a little bit because it, it's like the layers aren't really well designed to maintain a shape. I think it would work better if you mixed uh, most of the cheese sauce with the asparagus. Set a little aside because you do, I think you still want that appearance of like a very smooth top on the pie with the cheese sauce. So I'd say mix some of the cheese sauce with the asparagus, dump it in your pie shell, put that, that cheese on top and do, you know, just proceed as the recipe states, like broiling it and stuff. And I think it would turn out just a little bit better as far as holding its shape. But flavor wise, like I loved that one. I thought it was so good and very different. Like I always expect the, something like that to be a quiche, you know, to have eggs in it. This had no eggs in it. So the second dish I made, baked eggs and spinach casserole. I liked this one too. I really did. And it was, I, I did end up taking the other two servings and refrigerating them. And then I had them for two different breakfasts, like the following days. They reheated so well and I loved putting those on toast. I think I'm gonna try to start a trend for spinach toast <laughs> because it was so good. It's like spinach, cheese, and egg. So you can't really go wrong as long as you like those things. It was very easy to put together. Could see it as a brunch dish if you wanted to make the whole thing and then like sort of cut it into the squares around the eggs and serve it that way with toast points. It reheated really well. Like that was definitely something that you could do as a meal prep. It was just a good combination of flavors and I have been loving baked eggs for some reason like baked eggs are my thing right now so it was perfect it was perfect for me the avocado spinach salad this was very easy and it was very very quick to put together some of you may say it is it was barely a recipe I do try to have dishes like this in some of my videos just because you know maybe you're not going to follow the exact recipe but it might provide you a little bit of inspiration 
on some different things that you can do, some different ways you can make a salad, some different ingredients that you can you can put in there. I wouldn't say that you absolutely need the dressing that they recommend in here. I would say like any kind of oil and vinegar kind of vinaigrette dressing would go really well in this. So unless you're like, I, I totally am in love with that particular dressing, you could probably just make your own from from like oil, vinegar, herbs, salt, pepper, whatever. But I love the Swiss cheese and the avocado together. Oh, and I, I did eat the red onion. I don't think I mentioned it while I was sampling it. That little bit of red onion was fine. And so I'm, I'm advancing a little bit. It was very thinly sliced. And when I tossed it with the vinaigrette, it was more like a pickled onion, so I could kind of like handle it and it tasted good to me. It wasn't a lot. I probably not nearly as much as they would recommend in the recipe, but I gave it a try, right? And I, I would make it that way again, I think. The next time you're, you're putting together your lunch or dinner and you're thinking, mm, a salad sounds really good, maybe experiment a little bit and put, put some other types of ingredients in there and see how it turns out. I'd like to once again thank Babbel for sponsoring a portion of this video. If you'd like to give it a try, be sure to use my link in the description down below for 60% off your subscription. If you love recipes and cookbooks from the 1970s, I have an entire playlist and I'll link it in the description down below. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.